BBC Radio Lincolnshire. You're listening to Carla Green. And my next guest has written a book. It's called The Glorious Dead. He's with me in the studio to talk about it. Tim, before we talk about the book, I've got mm-hmm. to ask. Um, you gave up a job as a teacher to, I did. to be a stay-at-home dad and write a book. Now, um, as the mother of a 19-month-old baby... You know how it can be done. <laughs> yes, I heard you asking earlier on. the. Well, I mean, for a start, the children's ages are quite wide-ranging. My eldest is, tw- is 20, Charlie is 10, and Eloise is 7. So that helps a little bit. And since they started school, it's been an enormous help. And I'm about to say the book has taken five years, so okay. maybe I'd have done it an awful lot quicker if I hadn't had the childcare duties to... When do you write? What time of day? Um, it tends to be in the morning. Usually by the time I've walked the kids to school, walking back is quite good thinking time, so... I try to put the computer on before we leave the house, then it's on, ready for me to sit down at the desk and get to work um, at pretty well five minutes past nine. But at um, at any time of the day or night, really, whenever I can snatch the odd hour or half or whatever. I've got to say, Charlie is in the studio with us. Uh, I'm not sure, I didn't ask whether you wanted to, to go on the radio, but I am asking a question. Uh, do you pester Dad while he's writing, Charlie? Mm. No, yes. not not very much. No, <laughs> no, he's sometimes, very good. He's sometimes, very good. as they all are, they're all fantastic, and they they kind of know that it's what Dad does. It's Dad's non-job. So I sit around at the computer, cook them tea, go back, do a bit more work, and that's the way it goes. <laughs> do you sometimes lose Dad, Charlie, when he's gone off to write? Mm, yeah, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, it is lovely to have you both uh, in the studio with me. And uh, we've got to talk about this book. I have a copy in hand. We're going to give it away. And you have agreed to sign it. So Absolutely. Thank yeah. you for that, Tim. The Glorious Dead. And it's uh, it focuses on the stories of the First World War's grave diggers, which is, is a topic I don't really know much about. Not very many people do, Carla. And that's part of the reason that um, I was inspired to write it. I fell into the subject accidentally, conversation with a friend whose grandfather had been out... Um, well, he'd suffered from um, secondary gassing. He'd been poisoned by chlorine gas, but he'd only gone out to France and Flanders in 1919. So you asked the question, well, hang on, the war was over. Nobody was firing gas shells at that point in the uh, in the 20th century. So um, it had transpired that he'd been um, conscripted into the army and he'd been finally shipped over to France, but the armistice had happened in the meantime, so he did no fighting and he stayed on with the British army until 1921, clearing the old battlefields of stray ordnance and finding and burying the, the, the lost, the missing, the fallen. So is that when the majority of, of, of the grave digging, if you like, went on after the war had ended? It was, um, well, it was both. They did bury as many of the dead as they could during the war itself. But, I mean, clearly under gunfire and under shell fire, that was going to be dangerous as well as um, as well as difficult. So they were often very hastily buried. I mean, the, one of the reasons there are so many men without a known grave is because battlefield burials, hastily buried um, small groups of soldiers who fell in a particular battle, were subsequently destroyed by shell fire and no trace of either the bodies or the graves remain. So um, that's one of the reasons why there are so many names on the big memorial arches at uh, at uh, Tiapval and at um, the Men Gate in Ypres. What a task, though. I mean, it must take some some person to be able to go around and, and do that. I mean, it's It's, it's not, pretty um, grim, it's not regular it? kind of work, is it? But no. I suppose if you're in the army, if you've been conscripted, you're just following orders, you're just doing what the superiors told you. But the interesting thing that I've found out is that an awful lot of the men who had fought during the war decided, for whatever reason, to stay on and they weren't paid very much more. They were paid, I think, an extra two and six a day. But they chose to stay on sometimes one, two, up to three years until the point at which the army decided that was it. They could safely pack up and come back home um, to do that very job. Whether that was sort of out of loyalty to fallen comrades, survivor's guilt, who knows? But it's a fascinating story, and it's one, as you say, that so many people are totally unaware of. So I really thought, especially in this um, centenary year of the armistice, it was one that really needed to be brought to more people's attention. Well, it's been five years in the making, as you said. Uh, so, looking forward to, to reading it. And 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 within the, I suppose it's it's fiction based on fact, is it? We've got it characters. Is. Who it's, are they? What are they doing? I kind of lightly fictionalised it because there's an awful lot of first hand information, and there is some. Um, 
quite a lot of documentary evidence, but the, for a start, the documentary evidence, you'd be surprised, given that these are events that only happened 100 years ago, how contradictory some of that is. I mean, the story of the unknown um, soldier, burial in Westminster Abbey, for example, documentary sources can't agree on whether there were four or six exhumations from which one body was chosen. And that's a, something that only happened 100 years ago. So there were big holes in the historical narrative that I wanted to try and fill. And also, as I was doing the research, I felt I wanted conversations. You know, I wanted to try and get inside the minds of the people who did this. I wanted to hear their voice. And in particular, the character, the main protagonist, Jack, you know, has a working class voice. He's a private who's eventually promoted to Lance Corporal. But he's not an officer, but he's got a very rich interior life. He's got his own secretive motives for wanting to stay on and I thought weaving that personal narrative through the events themselves was probably the best way of, um, of showing people what happened. Yeah, well, we won't give too much away, no. obviously, because we don't want to, to spoil it. Uh, but there is a little bit of a romantic element mm. in there as well, Tim. Well, again, I beg your pardon, the, um, that kind of thing is based on fact. The... Um, the people that did stay on, some of them didn't then when the army disbanded in 1921. They chose to stay on in a civilian capacity. There are still people there in Belgium and in northern France who are descended from the Commonwealth War Graves gardeners that still to this day tend the um, iconic military cemeteries that we all that we all recognise as being sort of representative of the fallen in the first war. Um, so there were Anglo-Belgian, Anglo-French communities established because some of the the British soldiers, the British Tommies, decided that they were going to stay on and um, make lives for themselves in France. Some of them couldn't face what um, what they thought awaited them back home. Some of them thought the best way to, as I say, stay loyal to fallen comrades was to stay there and literally tend their graves. So, yeah, they struck up local romances with um, French and Belgian Belgian girls. And, of course, poignant as well, as you mentioned, that the, the book should be published uh, or certainly uh, it's going to be available to buy from the 1st of November. Publication 1st of November, that's right. Uh, and, of course, it coincides with the Armistice Centenary celebrations. Has that always been planned? Or? It's pretty well, yeah. I mean, with publishing, with books, with the kind of lead time that publishers work to, it's been impossible to, um, to guarantee. But it, as it's worked out, it couldn't have been any better, really. And uh, on the back... There is a, a comment on here from Ian McMillan, who mm. says, a powerful subject tackled with energy and skill. I mean, that is a commendation, isn't it? It's pretty good, yes. I'm pretty pleased with that, yes. How do you get those? Do you send them off to, to, to people and they yeah. review them? The publishers tend to send people that they think might be interested advanced copies, advanced proofs, and if they like it, you hope you can twist their arm to say something nice about it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it goes on the jacket. <laughs> uh, also, Martin Middlebrook, author of The First Day on the Somme, mm -hmm. mentioned, and Colonel Ian Standen, from, uh, or CEO of Bletchley Park Trust, uh, talking yeah. about about how you have uh, made sure the, the memory and sacrifice of those who died uh, is not forgotten. I mean, it's uh, to do that, I suppose, is enough, isn't it? I hope so, yeah. I hope what I've done is um, a fitting memorial to the people who did the British Army's sort of forgotten job post-war. Me in memory of the, the men who served their king and country, first with a rifle, then with a shovel on the, the front. Yeah. Um, it's lovely to speak to you about the book, and it's very kind of you to give us a copy to give away. It's my pleasure. Uh, how do you feel when you look at it now, in it's print, bound? It's wonderful. Five years' work, just at a bound, and... You've got to say, obviously, it's radio, so people can't see the cover, but I am so thrilled. If The book is about 90,000 words long, and it's a cliche, isn't it? A picture can paint a thousand words. Well, that picture certainly represents the book, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Whoever designed that has done a terrific job. It's, it couldn't have been any better. Three soldiers walking into the sunset holding shovels. Holding shovels, but then, as if you look really closely, they've got tiny little tap roots going deep down into the foreign soil beneath their boots, sort of showing that the fact that uh, the war's over, but they're not going home. And on the back, just the one poppy. That's Alone, very yeah. moving, isn't it? It is. It's, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And Charlie, how, how does it feel for you seeing Dad's work in print? You can buy this in bookshops, Charlie. This mm. is your dad look, <laughs> yeah. Tim Atkinson. Mm. Yeah, and it's quite just seeing the book now as a proper book rather than... Because I've 
loads of times seeing it just as a picture on the screen yeah. and then now seeing it as an actual book is, yeah. It's quite, uh, mm. quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. Loads of time, of course, you've seen it as piles of paper with yeah. loads of scribbled notes and, all over. <laughs> yeah, and like little pictures of like covers that could be used with scribbles yes, on yeah. them and stuff. Are you proud of him? Yeah. Oh, that's Thank lovely, you, lovely. Have you got any more in store, Tim? Well, yeah, I've got two more that would follow that up as sequels, really, because I uncovered so much material. As I was saying earlier, you know, the, the fact that so many of these people stayed on, and then when they were demobbed from the army in 1921, they still didn't go home and they married local girls. And they ended up, some of them, in um, northern France and Belgium until they were hastily evacuated on the eve of um, the Second World War. Um, and I'd like to kind of carry the story on until then, if possible. So, yeah, that's the next project. We'll wait for that. Another five years? I hope not. <laughs> no, a bit quicker this time. Um, and thank you again. As I said, you've given us a copy of The Glory is Dead to give away. I'll do that now. Tim will sign it as well. Um, I'll do what I always do. I'll play two songs back to back. Get in touch if you'd like me to send this to you.